Good evening. Welcome to the 2019-2020 uh, Edwina and Charles Milner Women in the Artists Series uh, Lecture. Women in the Artists Show and Series Lecture. That's a long title. Um, my name is Jim Pendergast. I'm the newly minted uh, chair of the Expressive Arts, de Arts Department. I've got some big shoes to, to fill following Michael Metcalf, who's been chair more often than not uh, here at Western uh, New Mexico University. Um, I want to give a big, big thanks to Michael for being such a wonderful, wonderful boss. Uh, he approached the job with such care, grace, and intelligence. So thank you very much, Michael. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, we're here, of course, to uh, listen to a wonderful artist and her approach to art. Faye McCalmont is going to be introducing her in a few minutes. Uh, but I do want to, uh, uh, what's that? Oh, no. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'll introduce her fast. Harper. <laughs> So I'm very excited. She's she's a woman that is filled with laughter and light and a sparkle. And so I know that you're all going to very much enjoy the, the lecture tonight. And I also want to let you know that we have our new season um, rack cards back here on the chair in case you want to pick one up. We have all kinds of concerts and more lectures in this series, the chamber music series, all kinds of things that you can um, participate in. So just pick one of these up on your way out. Thank you. And you will see her personality in that work. I had a, a fun time putting up one of the big shoes on the wall with her today. <laughs> but uh, we do want to give a big thanks, of course, to Edwina and Charles Milner, for uh, whom uh, we wouldn't be here tonight, uh, except for their generosity. And so um, uh, we appreciate them giving us the opportunity to uh, bring on these wonderful shows and artists and really encourage all people, but especially women, to pursue this very challenging path of art. So even though they're not here, let's give them a big uh, thank you. Let's do it. And now, Director Pendergast, and thank you all very much for coming. I know some of you are still in attendance um, at the university. Some of you are living in this beautiful town, which I want to thank you all for the most incredible, warm welcome. Everybody from my darling friend from high school days, Marianne Bartlett, and her darling husband, Jeff, who is also videotaping. I want to give a very, very warm thank you to Dr. Joe Shepard, and I know he and beloved Valerie Plame, a very, very dear friend of mine who's running for Congress from Santa Fe, they had to jump on a plane uh, late this afternoon to head back up to Santa Fe and do some work, but they were very generous and gave a wonderful dinner party last night to which some of you were there and I wanna thank them. Uh, and the chef, unbelievable sparkly dinner. I would also like to thank very kindly to Faye for helping organize as well as to Chala Werber. Is she here? Stand up. I, when I see your name, would you all stand up? Marianne and Jeff Bartlett, please stand up. And Chala, remain standing. And Faye, please stand. And Michael, you may stand. Mr. Michael Acosta, what a cool as a cucumber AV guy. They always are. But and there wasn't anything that he couldn't accomplish. And Big Mike, where's Big Mike? Because I can't see with the light in my eyes. <laughs> big, big Mike was the first person I met who drove all the way up from Silver City with Michael's big van and his trailer, picked everything up, drove it perfectly. All my podiums, the glass, everything that I had given him was completely breakable. Nothing was damaged, so thank you for that. And I want to just say, 
hopefully after the show, I'll have a few minutes to actually go and experience your beautiful, beautiful city. It does remind me a little bit about, of Santa Fe, but it has all of its own unique charms. So I'm just gonna start off and say a little tiny bit about myself, but not much because quite a bit we will talk about in my little artist uh, video. It's about three and a half minutes long and it gives a really great overview. So I think I'd rather have you listen to me on film and then I'll just fill in the gaps and we'll leave at least 10 or 15 minutes if you would like for question and answer afterward. And Michael, go ahead, roll the movie. Since the age of two, I have loved playing in the mud. I've been working on the wheel for many, many years, and instead of doing glazed work, I came and stumbled onto this extremely unique form of smoke firing, which I've done. I add smoke firing to my planners, my sculpture work, to just about anything from an inch high to 35 inches in diameter, and almost as big and high. a sense of humor into my work and as serious as I am with making my living and doing my artwork I love adding bright colors for me color is pizzazz color is sexy color is what registers first in your mind color is an emotion I get inspired by painters I even work with painters so Instead of making just miniature pieces, which I used to do at Harvard when I worked in their ceramic studio, I now have expanded my horizons to work with clay and do mostly decorative works of art. Circular motion is infinity. The circular motion to me is relaxing. The circular motion to me means I am just about ready to bring something forth. When I'm on the wheel, I always start everything with just a very, very strict cylinder. My mind just goes a million miles away, and that's when I can get different pieces that just come out out of nowhere. Sometimes I squish them, sometimes I karate chop them, sometimes I throw them up in the air and catch them. But however they result, I have to decide whether they get smoked or they get painted or I add 22 karat gold, it doesn't matter. There's always a solution to matter whatever I have made. Art is waking up and being creative. My happiest moments are literally sitting at the wheel and just making forms and shapes. What I love to do is work with my clients and collectors to actually have them slice, fold, squish in, and then tell me what colors they love. I like to incorporate them into working on the sculptures with me. And from that point forward, they get to own the pieces creatively as well as have them in their homes. Art in motion. That's me. While Michael sets up the next quick little video, and it's literally a minute and 59 seconds, this one, which he's about ready to cue in, is called Clay is Love. But this is something that took me five years to finally get the courage of to create. Uh, so I could say I directed it, but it's a minute and 59 seconds, so I think that's a bit brash. But there's this lovely uh, Native American fellow, Adam Joaquin. He's an acrobat, a horse whisperer. He does just about everything. He works with the opera. And he's always said he would love to be a knucklehead with me, which is basically my spirit, and do a complete and utter spoof from the famous clay scene in the movie Ghost. Who here has not seen the movie Ghost? A small handful. Okay, I will quickly say, in this movie starring the fabulous Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze, may he rest, they first started their romance as she was a potter and he decided one evening for a sexy moment just to come in behind her 
and work with her on the wheel. And of course, at the end, there's something funny that happens. But I just love that scene, and that movie did so much for the ceramic clay world. It's incredible. And so we kind of had a good time. And no, I don't normally wear fancy pants clothes. Occasionally, when I lecture, or when I go to a ball, or when I was offered the opportunity to be Artist of the Year in Santa Fe this year. So I did wear this dress then. So without further ado, Unchained Melody and Clay is Love. Thanks, Michael. Jana. I'll, I'll give a quick intro, um, and hopefully the internet will be obedient in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. This is also a very quick video, and I will say a lot of people refer to me as a, an extremely great success. And yes, being Artist of the Year is a great moniker, but I know that a lot of luck comes to people who work very, very hard. And sometimes I do, but mostly I just say I play. But one day I got a call from a producer for Jana De Laurentiis' uh, Food Network, and I thought it was a joke, because they asked if I wanted to teach her how to do pottery. And you know, we all get way too many solicitations on the phone, and I thought this was one of them, so I promptly hung up, which was quite stupid, because luckily they called me back and said, no, we're quite serious. Um, we would like to have you teach Jada to do pottery. She's coming to Santa Fe to do Jada's weekend getaways. And I thought, well, okay, we'll see if this actually happens. And it did, and wow, did that put me on the map. It's only a couple of minutes, but she was very good, very professional, and press the button. Hi, I'm Jada De Laurentiis, and welcome to a weekend in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We'll discover a garden blooming with art and a restaurant with a deep history. How cool is that? Throw in a spin on the wheel, the workout. And these are the places you have to visit in this magical southwestern town. It's all ahead on my food filled weekend in Santa Fe. And my weekend starts now. Wow. Mexico is known as the land of enchantment. Spend time in Santa Fe and you'll discover why. Its mystical beauty attracts visitors from around the world. With a thriving art scene and award-winning food, Santa Fe is the perfect three-day getaway. It's Saturday afternoon in Santa Fe, a town known for creative expression. So I'm heading to Heidi Lowen's Porcelain Gallery to make my own masterpiece. Hello, Jana, it's so nice to see you. Are you ready for class? Heidi's is one of the few places in Santa Fe where you can stop by for a few hours and create pottery. Heidi uses porcelain, a white clay known for its great strength. You know what? I would love to be able to just get my hands dirty on this one. You and are so bold. You're, you're, that's you're great. really nervous. The texture's like cream cheese. That's it's like fabulous. taking a bar of cream cheese and just putting your hands right through it, squeezing it. Excellent. It does take quite a bit of strength 
Right. And whenever you watch a person who's working on a wheel, no matter how new, it looks so easy. It does, but it's certainly not that easy. This is a workout. I kind of feel like Demi Moore a little bit. This hand, we're going to use most of your thumb, and we're going to compress in the middle, and then we're going to add a little bit more water. Oh my god, okay. it's disappearing. It's disappearing. Now it's gently disappear. Okay. okay. I sucked my thumb in my quicksand. That is so cool. It's kind of like forming dough. Like, you know when you play with dough, you make some kind of pastry dough? Yeah, absolutely. It's like forming that. That is gorgeous. I love the contrast. Once your piece takes shape, you can pick out the colors. Leave the rest to Heidi. She adds the finishing touches and sends you the work of art a few weeks later. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. Well, I thank you. Let me do it, Italy. Mm -hmm. I'm off to my next adventure. <laughs> and there's another little film with Samantha Brown, but we, we may show it in a little bit. But I thought what I do is just intersperse a few words in between um, the little films and just talk a little bit about my background because I think it's always very interesting to learn how did an artist become an artist. And as I said, and in the film as well, that since the age of two, I always loved to play in the mud. Um, and the reason probably is, was in upstate New York and Rochester, there was a lot of mud, particularly because my parents were gardeners. Um, my, my dad was an optical scientist at Bausch and Lomb, and my mom had been a nurse in England where she grew up. And she then a nurse during the Blitzkriegs during World War II, and apparently was quite the little renegade because toward the end of the, her 20s, she decided she'd come over and nurse at Brigham and Women's, which is now Brigham and Women's, had a different name back then. And she was set up on a blind date with my dad, who was getting his postdoc at MIT. And I'm one of the results. And uh, it was interesting because uh, constantly playing in the mud, that was kind of my best toy. And when I was 10, my mom said, okay, I think it's time for you to take a real clay class. And I loved it. And as a 10 year old, I won a little prize. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And uh, that really, really started me off. And I think, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Captain Kangaroo, but he had this incredible line, which was, if you do as an adult what you loved as a kid, then you will be passionate about it and most likely quite successful. But I never took the path to be an artist. My mom, have, after having been a nurse, was an amazing artist in everything she did and she touched, whether it was painting or collage work or decorating our home, um, cooking, entertaining, which she did voraciously because my father was always entertaining guests from all over the world to work with him as interns because it was a very tiny specialty of spectroscopy, which is the science of light. And of course, light comes into play with art all the time. Um, but people often say, I moved to Santa Fe, or maybe they say they moved to Silver City because the light here is so great and you have a lot of sunshine. And Mr. Metcalf and I talked about that, and Mar and Jeff, because being from upstate New York, what does upstate New York have? Rain. Lots of it. Gray days. 64 days only sunshine a year. Can you imagine living here and only having 64 days of sun? So, but I moved to Santa Fe because I loved the mountains, I loved the skiing, and I loved the snow, which of course reminded me of porcelain. So again, I never set out to be an artist, but what ended up happening was I decided when I went to Skidmore College in upstate New York, and if any of you knew, know Saratoga Springs, which Michael does because he went to Skidmore, a little bit after me, but what an amazing town, culturally, artistically, intellectually, and the Victorian architecture is incredible there. So I love Saratoga, but I also love their ceramic and their art department and their languages. But by far my favorite year of college was the year I spent in Paris at the Sorbonne. So who wouldn't want to spend a year in Paris? I don't know, but that was an incredible eye-opener to me. I did very little art, but studied a lot of languages and art history 
and everywhere you went, every shop window, everything was art to me. And of course, the food and the wine and the way the women dressed. And when I graduated, I couldn't wait to go back to Europe, so I did. And I ended up working in a tiny little town, mountain village, north of Montreux, where they have the jazz festival, Les Zins. You take a little tiny cog rail completely up the windy roads, and I think I'm going back to Santa Fe through your beautiful, is it the Black Mountains? The Black Range, thank you. So hopefully I won't get a speeding ticket, but uh, Les Zins was an incredible ski town, and it had the American College of Switzerland, so I taught by day, and I worked in the admissions office and the, as a telephone operator because I was fluent in French. But what an amazing, amazing year and a half I had after college. And Mary Ann Bartlett also came over and we had some wild adventures, right, Mayor? <laughs> she even had a faux wedding before her real wedding coming back to the States, but that's another issue. So my father, being the wonderful dad that he was, said very gently, Heidi, are, are you ever going to come back to the States? And I thought, well, that, he asked it in such a nice way. I thought, well, maybe I should really come back. So I did. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I knew I would like to be like my mom, super organized, which I'm not, but I, I thought maybe that's who I could be. So I knew I wanted not to live in Rochester, but I wanted to live and work in New York City. And I had worked for several months during college at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I loved. And then I was very lucky. The second day I landed in New York, I went to a temp office and got a great job doing French translation work at the United Nations. Well, I was there for three months and got called into the office by the director. And I thought, oh my god, I'm going to get fired, which is a terrible way to think. But that's truly what I thought. I didn't know what I had done wrong, but I got called in and I wasn't fired. I was offered a permanent job. But the irony was that that very morning, I had been offered a job to work at Sotheby's, the art auction house. And uh, so all of a sudden, I didn't know what to do. But this director was so horrible and said so many terrible things. Why would you want to work at Sotheby's with all of those? And I won't finish the sentence. It was just totally derogatory, which was actually great, because that was the absolute perfect sign I needed to never work another day at the United Nations where it was incredibly sexist and on and on and on. So I took the job at Sotheby's and loved it. Seven years, it was fabulous. At first it was dreadful because I worked in a terrible department. They called it the basement. And, but I worked my way up like most people can do and I worked in the Chinese and Japanese division, which I love. So anything, paintings, Netsky, ivories, at the time, we could do ivory, ceramics, of course, fabric work, everything, jades, bronzes, and it truly was inspiring my future work, but I had no clue. And uh, after seven years of working there, my wonderful old boss, Joe Kiefer, uh, had get, gotten headhunted, which is also a terrible expression, but he got asked to help manage and run a private art foundation Spring Creek Art Foundation in Boston, and he kindly asked if I wanted to come and be his slave. Do you see the pattern? And I said, well, Joe, I'll come and work with you, but I'm not gonna be your slave. Well, of course I was his slave, but it was great. And this was an art foundation owned and managed by Bill Koch, one of the Koch brothers, you all probably know about, but we really didn't know about the older brothers at that point. But it was a fascinating seven years. And then they all moved to Florida, and my husband and I, and my one-year-old son moved to Santa Fe. And I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but he was a baby. And when he was about a year and a half, and a little close to two, and starting a little bit of daycare, I thought, well, I'll just go back to Santa Fe Clay and work for a while. And uh, like Leonard Bernstein, who started to conduct because somebody was ill, and I am no Lenny Bernstein, believe me, but they asked me to teach. And I said, well, I can't teach at Santa Fe Clay. I said, I don't have any teaching credentials. And they said, oh, no, no, you'll be fine just for tonight. And I said, well, okay, I'll help out. And I loved it. And I had the best students ever. So if you truly ever want to learn a subject, go and teach it. Take the books out, take classes yourself, and then get yourself in a position where you can teach because it is a blast. How many people in the audience are teachers? Wow, wow. So you know what I'm talking about. It's so much fun to teach. 
So I'm going to shut up right now and let you just play. I guess let's just talk about some of the work. So what happened in Santa Fe was after I taught and I had a blast, well, they weren't paying very much and they were kind of mean and I, the people who directed Santa Fe Play and I thought, well, you know what? My husband, bless his heart, he'd been at MIT and Harvard Business School, though he hated business. And he said, Heidi, why don't you just start your own school? And I thought, oh, oh, good Lord, I could never do that. He said, well, you can and you should because you've been complaining too much. <laughs> so I did listen to him and I started my own little tiny school and lo and behold, I never looked back. It was so much fun. But then when I realized a friend of mine was moving to Italy and said, why don't you take my space and it could be your gallery. Well, that was the last thing I thought of. I mean, I, I didn't want to run a gallery, but I ended up running a gallery, and I've done it since 1995 in Santa Fe. <coughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the work. Um, when I worked at the Spring Creek Art Foundation and worked for Bill Koch, and managed his private collection as well, uh, which was an absolute blast, I had the opportunity to work at night and during the weekends at the Harvard Ceramic Studio, which if you have not visited, absolutely go and visit. They have a gorgeous, gorgeous museum, uh, and a, a gallery, I should say there, many museums, but uh, they have really a state-of-the-art ceramic studio. And because they have such tremendous backing and funding, they are in a position to invite artists from all over the world, every single country, continent, and we have slideshows and movies and potluck dinners, so why would you not want to go? And what an inspiration. So I'll just talk a little bit about this series. Um, as I talked about in the little film at the beginning, everything I do is on the wheel, except for the carved shoes, and then I just throw from a big lump, and I just start throwing bigger and bigger. And the only reason I started smoke firing is because the kiln malfunctioned one day, and I had a show coming up, and I didn't know what to do. And a friend said, oh, just smoke fire. It'll be fine. The natives do it beautifully. You'll figure it out. I had no clue what she was talking about, but I have been figuring it out ever since. This series, in fact, the one on the upper left, it had been called kryptonite. And it's simply a piece that's sliced, squished, folded in, and I threw in a couple of uh, titanium and opalized crystals, quartz crystals. And in the show, you'll see it as soon as you go into the gallery. And I, of course, invite you all to come and look at the show after. And this one is now entitled Silver City Kryptonite, in your honor. Thank you very much. So you, you will see some uh, concepts of these pieces in the show tonight. Um, they're all done on the wheel and simply squished. And then where there is gold, it's usually 22 or 23 carats, so it won't tarnish. And then if the red is really poppy, it's because there is 22 karat gold underneath, and then on top of that, I will place a thin wash of oil paint. When that's dry, then I'll add varnish just to make it shiny, if the piece warrants. Um, and then let's just talk about the bottom middle one. You can see, I will say maybe the bottom middle one uh, toward the back, that's about a six inch diameter. And then you'll see the little piece in the middle with the handle, a somewhat of an Etruscan shape, and that handle is simply braided. And there's so many different things you can do with your clay because, at least to me, it's somewhat of a liquid. It's not, of course, but when you add the water, it's lovely and squishy and mushy. So it has a sense of humor. Well, I think it has a sense of humor. Um, go ahead to the next category, anyone you like. So here we have a number of platters, and they are for the most part smoked. Some of them are carved or chattered, which is nothing I invented, and I'm sure most of you who are potters here know what I'm talking about. You simply re-center and secure very well the platter to the wheel, so it does not go flying. And yes, I've had many go flying. And you take a loop tool, and you just hold it, and it bounces or chatters and carves as it goes round. The one, the second one down, in from the right, second also in from the right, actually has copper wire. This was done for a client who had a very, very famous architect, uh, Richard Dick, in Santa Fe, and their whole house is a square built around a circle. So 
hence that piece for them. On the bottom right is an egg, and this is actually in honor of my grandmother, my British grandmother and my mom, who often had soft boiled eggs. So that piece is, if I take my arms like so, and the yolk is done separately, painted a bright yellow enamel, and hence the egg. Um, and the bottom two pieces, one is in Canada at the Four Seasons, and the other one was in a Biennale in uh, Albuquerque. And the one on the left has an actual, uh, looks like a silver interior, but of course it's aluminum, so it will not tarnish. And if you, turn, if you were to turn it and look straight down with a handle away from you, the shape is a heart. So. Um, and just to give you an idea of scale, because it's difficult to tell in slides, but for instance, the very bottom left one is about 36 inches high. And my kiln goes to 30, but I have a wonderful number of commercial kilns down the road, which I'm lucky enough to be able to use and cook there. Mm -hmm. So these are all smoked. And by smoked, I don't mean sagger. I mean that I take the piece out of my back deck, put it on a table, and have combustibles from pine needles to papers to basically banana peels, dried oranges, anything that will burn, I will use. And some of the green uh, flecking is caused from something, but that I don't share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> I'm also super, super lucky to live in Santa Fe. And one of the questions they ask me to answer is uh, whether I would be a mentor to any of the young women who are here. I'll mentor a woman, a man, it doesn't matter what animal, I will mentor them. But don't do it via email, I beg you, because I'm besieged by emails every day. So if you ever want to talk to me about art or a clay world, give me a call, and my business cards are on the desk inside. So the other reason I love living in Santa Fe, and you probably all love living here, is that there are so many artists. And one of the other questions is, how am I, how do I connect with other artists? Well, in Santa Fe and Silver City, you can't but connect with other artists, because everybody in Santa Fe is an artist. Even if you're a scientist, you could also be a writer. Uh, medical researcher, I consider all of those people artists. They're creating and they're thinking outside. So all of these pieces look as if there is crumpled paper, copper wire, sticks, cloth, stone. But in fact, and I am lucky enough to have one piece here in the show, these are all platters done by me that are smoked. And the painting is done by this amazing Dutchman who actually signed up for a class with me 22 years ago. And ever since, we have been doing one platter together a year. I do the platter, I smoke it. Other than this bottom left that looks like cloth on a cross, so this one is actually porcelain wedged many, many times over with dark brown clay. And I never tell him what to do. I just give him the piece and he then does his painting. And of course, it's the shadows that make the pieces look so three-dimensional. I will note on the uh, bottom right, or the full one, which has the nest and the three eggs. So this is probably one of my favorite ones he did. It is now in the collection of a wonderful couple who own the largest almond farm in uh, Northern California. But they also raise prize chickens. So they were infatuated with the eggs, and that is the one thing I talked to Brault about. I said, instead of making three white eggs, please make them three different colors. And that was what this woman was looking for. So I was very lucky. And it's difficult to tell because the film is not great, but there are four pieces of theoretical or painted red yarn coming out north, south, east, and west. But if you can see with your good eyes, at the very bottom, if you would, six o'clock on, on, the, on the clock, there is the red yarn coming off of the pot. So it is, in fact, painted trompe l'oeil, and then we spliced in very, very carefully a real piece of red yarn, and hence the sense of humor. So the one before, up above, when you saw with the copper wire in the tic-tac-toe, Michael, bring up the bottom once. The very bottom right, 
that looks like real wire, but in fact, that is painted. And Brault is from uh, Rotterdam in Holland. And if you can imagine a man of such talent, his father told him being a painter was stupid. So I'm here to tell you, at any age, you can be and become whoever you want. The very bottom two are done by a very famous painter in Santa Fe also, by the name of Gigi Mills, and she only wanted to use grays and blacks, and I thought, oh, good Lord. So when you see them in the show tonight, I've embellished with gold leaf and a little red and a little blue wash. You'll take a look. And the bottom right, an amazing painter and ceramic artist by the name of Jean-Pierre Aubon, uh, and he is from Chile, from Santiago, Chile, but he was in Santa Fe for a couple years, and he came and took a class, and then we also worked together. So the one in the middle top is called Tide, and you will see that in the show. And the only reason I have it is because I'm old enough, my client passed, and the estate asked if I wanted to purchase it back, and I pounced on it. All right, go ahead. I also think that's a great way to further one's career, work with another artist, and then you've automatically multiplied your client base by at least a factor of two, <laughs> yours and theirs. So one day before Christmas, I thought, you know what, I need to take a break from doing this serious work. So I just took some clay, sat at my mill, and started carving, and what was I gonna carve? Well, shoes, because what woman doesn't like shoes? And because my aunties on both sides of the family are incredibly talented with clothing, I was always surrounded by fabric and fur and gemstones. And one of my aunts, Frances Bunyard, was a super famous uh, calligrapher and stone carver. If you're ever in Boston, she did almost all the signage for the Harvard and what had then been Radcliffe, but also hospitals and a huge 15 foot wide circular plaque for Faneuil Hall downtown. So these are only about six, six and a half inches long, but they're all decorated differently. And I'll just give you an example on the far left um, is called Tina, as in Turner, of course, and that one is sold, but also the next one, Diamonds, our girl's best friend, so who doesn't love Marilyn? And the next one is Arsenic and Old Lace, and the top one is Come Prance With Me, and so on and so forth. I have an aversion to any art piece being called untitled. I just think that's drab and boring. It should have a story. It should invite you to think, or ask the artist, or just ponder. So one day I was visiting, go ahead, you can change into anything, it doesn't matter. One day I was visiting a wonderful artist friend of mine who does animal sculptures in bronze. She's super, super famous. And she said, I've got to go up to my Thai metal crafters foundry. Would you like to come with me? Well, of course I'd like to go. And it was an incredible experience. And the owner had just taken over Karn Von Sintan from his father. And he said, I looked at your website, Heidi. Why don't you send me a six inch shoe with no adornment? I can model it up as big as you like, and I can get a six foot shoe done in time for Miami Basel. This was several years ago, and he did just that. But we'll get to the shoes in a moment. So these are just a simple form in the round, a fishbowl shape, sliced, curled, and furled. And a number of people earlier today, because the students came by and were just wonderful and asked all kinds of great questions when I gave them a tour of the show. And I don't typically place my work um, because to me that's, uh, I, I like to live large and so I make things that are completely useless and ridiculous, meaning you can't eat off of them. But the top two you could, the top one is only about an inch and a half high and those are both sold. And the one on the far right is simply a cylinder punched in and waved at the top. And then the next three in a row are the uh, swirl, I call it chocolate and vanilla swirl, I call those Dairy Queen series. And then the bottom with the jade, um, the, also the one on the left I should say is a low fire spat, uh, crackle. And that one is about an inch high. And then the little jade pieces, you can see the size because it's at my hand. And those were some of the last pieces I did at Harvard, sorry, not too close. And uh, I had submitted those the year I got into Santa Fe to the Museum of Fine Arts for a show, and they couldn't decide, the judge couldn't decide which one to take until the 
uh, kind slide projector man, that shows you how long ago it was, said, oh, but Jerry, these pods are only an inch to an inch and a half high. So they took all of them and showed them all. So I have only one slide of an installation, and it's simply a series of white platters that are carved and in porcelain, of course, and then the interior, some of them are platinum, and the others are 22 karat. And I have three different ones that are in the show tonight. I did a series of seven, and they got placed beautifully and randomly above a two and a half story high chimney inside a gorgeous, gorgeous home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Do you want to do the shoes? There we go. So you can see here that Darling Karn Bonsingtong did a fabulous six foot cast aluminum shoe. And this six foot shoe, I carefully put uh, opalized crystals down the back spine and also on the front, which you can see more easily on the lower left slide. And I very carefully had it created, sent it to Miami and I won an enormous sculpture award. In fact, the silly picture of me in the middle, down below, wearing pink fluffy outfit, um, it's marabou fur inside the shoe, and I'm also wearing pink marabou, which I got in Thailand. But this was about two minutes before I discovered I was winning a big sculpture award for that. And a different shoe, but the same deep ruby red, sort of an honor of Dorothy, right, um, is on the roof of my gallery. And it's at an angle such that you can see the bright blue illuminated lights from inside. And yes, because it's Santa Fe, we get tons of rain and snow, but it usually melts by noon. And there are two holes in the ball of the foot underneath, so all the moisture can drain out. And I don't get in too much trouble with the City Fathers because it's not considered a permanent installation. Although I consider it a permanent installation. So I I think that's pretty much it for the slides of my work, but would you like to show the clay is love? vis-a-vis -vis this wonderful lecture that I'm so honored to do for Edwina and Charles Milner. But one of the questions was, truly, do you have a specific mentor? And I really had to think long and hard. I have so many people in my life, great teachers like Regis Brody, which Michael and I have both had the pleasure. You, you took many classes with him, did you not? Ah, but with... We jump, okay. And Regis Brody, by the way, was in charge of the ceramic department for decades at, at Santa Fe, in, at Skidmore, rather. And I've also invited him several times to Santa Fe, and he's been wonderful to lecture and, and teach and show his work. And he does huge monumental pieces, um, as big as June Kaneko, uh, which most, most of you know. So I can't really say I had one particular mentor um, other than myself. Um, but I will say that when I grew up, and nobody ever believed this, I was deathly shy, horribly shy. And the thought of public speaking was just horrific. But the more you do what you love, the easier it gets. And I will just say, so many people have been my mentors. Uh, chefs have been my mentors, just the way they prepare food. 
um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an artist. Um, I've learned from so many different people. And one of the other things they asked, aside from would I become a mentor, and the answer is yes, but one of the questions was how do you connect with creatives? And I touched about that in terms of being in Santa Fe where everybody is an artist, but basically how do you follow your own individual path? Well, I remember Oprah saying she always wanted to be just like Barbara Walters until someone said to her, but there already is a Barbara, you just need to be you. So that's what I try to do. So I would love to offer the floor any questions whatsoever, but I just want to say thank you again to everybody who helped me set up the show. And I, is Wyatt here? I don't know if he could come this evening, um, but he was also fabulous. So any questions from anybody? I'll ask Mar, since I know her. Oh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I, I kind of like doing it all. I think I'm always happy when I have a commission, and I would say probably 70% of the work that, I, that goes out the door is because it's a specific request. And as I mentioned earlier today, uh, I even had a client who saw a huge piece of mine she was a decorator, and she said, oh, that's lovely, but it's at least a half an inch too big. So I said, oh, no problem, because I was excited to get the, it was a huge commission. I said, no problem, I can recreate it. I'll just make it half an inch shorter and half an inch less wide. And she said, perfect. So I did it, it was gorgeous. I went and delivered it. She lived just outside of Santa Fe in the La Dida section on the golf courses. And she said, I placed it, and she said, oh, don't you think it's a little small? <laughs> I said, no, madam, it's perfect. And I've never talked to her again. <laughs> but I, I, I guess I've been doing so many non-traditional and non-glazed pieces for so long, that's sort of my path. Actually, my, my question is related to uh, your non-glazed work. I was wondering if you ever color your porcelain. If you use white, but do you ever add color to Oh, and I thought you said collar, no, like a collar, because no, I do collar in. Do I color my porcelain yes, in, in, in the clay? Yes, I do. I saw the mixture. You of the well, I typically do more marbleizing, yeah, I saw that. but I, and I guess I don't because I just, and I always, I will confess, I do work with surgical gloves, not because I don't love the feel of the clay, I do, I absolutely love it, but I work with surgical gloves because um, I'm in and out of city water, and almost all city water all over the world is filled with chlorine, and I just don't like, I mean, I don't like to trash my little princess hands. And usually I'm a pig pen slob all day, every day, so this is rare. Um, but do, do you use a lot of uh, colorants in your clay? Um, so I have to, back in college, uh, when I, was, I, I'm not a professional artist, but back in college when I did take, our two classes, we actually worked with um, um, porcelain, and some of my classmates were coloring their porcelain. They colored it green, they colored it blue. I right. mean, it was gorgeous. So they were adding chrome for the green, and they yes. were adding some yes. form of cobalt for the, to yes. make it blue, yes. and so on and so forth. Exactly. Iron oxide to give it that flower pot red, yes. that beautiful yes. Indian red that we love. Yes. Exactly. No, that's a beautiful thing to do, but no, I don't do that. No, probably, probably because I'm, I don't know if I'm really lazy. I mean, but I love the light, but I mean, it's, it's yeah. just brilliant, but I just wonder, I'm just thinking back to it. Well, and you know, ago, right? anyway. for sure. That reminds me, um, many, many years ago, I had a wonderful woman come in, and I never know who's going to come in the gallery. And by the way, if you're crazy enough to be an artist and a teacher and a gallery owner, my hat is off to you, because any one of those jobs is way more than a full-time job right teaching and being your own full-time artist but you also have to market your work and most artists really don't like to market and one of the other things i should address because the wilner uh lecture series did discuss like do you make your living as an artist and i'm going to say yes 100 percent. my income comes from being an artist and um you know I, i'm going to say that 
although I do think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, as a professional, what do you have to do? You've got to create your work, and then are you doing enough? Are you doing the right pieces? Are you marketing enough? Are you pricing things properly? Are you showing enough in museums? Are you showing enough in other galleries? And I could do a number of art shows all over the country, and the Miami Basel was one of my favorites, but I'm lucky enough to live in Santa Fe, and you all here, people come to Santa Fe and they come to Silver City already thinking about art. I also was a genius, I was not a genius at all, but I pretend, because my gallery ended up literally right down the road from the George O'Keefe Museum. So, and, and you would think, though it's literally a minute and 12 second walk, they'd all come to the end of the street to visit, nay, 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 nay. They, they go as far as the O'Keefe Museum for the most part, and then they walk right back to the plaza. But my saving grace is that my front door looks right out to the famous Santa Fe School of Cooking, pottery cooking, perfect simpatico, right? So if you can choose your location well, bravo. Most people come to Santa Fe and they go to Canyon Road or the rail yard now for contemporary, but I'm not on Canyon Road, I can't afford those rents, nor I'm on the rail yard. So I'm in a little tiny adobe building, the whole thing is 900 square feet. Um, I teach there, I create there, I break there, I clean up there, um, and I do team teaching. I also work and do corporate team building. Um, sometimes I do it in my gallery, and then I've also done quite a bit of work for a little company with a, that starts with the letter A. I'm not supposed to say what it is, but you probably buy a lot of things from them, so you can guess. Um, and I've done that for a number of years in a row, and that is a blast. I teach grown-ups to come in for their big weekends, and then also their, all their children, and that is fun. And I've even hired Valerie Plain, who's with Dr. Joe Shepard, because her daughter had to be called out to a soccer game or volleyball game, and she, I said, oh, well, you'll have to come now and pour the champagne to all these lovely people. And she said, oh, I'll be there in a heartbeat. And I, and I was just joking. But she came and she loved it. There were some really famous authors, so she had a blast. But you never think you're marketing enough. You never think, oh, I don't. But I, I think that's a human trait, not necessarily an artistic trait. Um, do all of you think you're doing just enough? I mean, maybe you do. I, I just, I never think I'm creating enough, so. Any other questions? Mikey? Darling, big, helpful Mikey? No? All right. Well. I've talked enough. Shall we go and take a look at the work? Yes. And then ask many questions if you like. And I want to thank you all for coming. This is Heidi Lowen again, and I just want to say what an incredible honor it is to have both had an exhibition for the month of October here at the Western University of New Mexico, and also to be able to do this lecture I want to say a very, very special thank you to Edwina and Charles Milner, who have been so very involved in the entire art world, particularly in the state of New Mexico, and for making this lecture series possible. And I love working with young people of all ages in the art world, in the painting world, in the sculpture world, in the ceramic world. And I am totally honored to be able to offer myself up as a mentor for any young women, particularly here at this university, to work with them. It is going to be a great challenge in the world, no matter what you do, but it's always particularly helpful to have somebody you can look up to and easily ask questions of in terms of their career and the choices they want to make in the art world. I've been blessed my whole life, and I'd love to share that. A number of years ago, I received an amazing opportunity. The incredible city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in conjunction with UNESCO, offered for me, as well as Rose B. Simpson, the incredible ceramic and metal sculptor from Santa Clara Pueblo, to go, just the two of us, to visit a beautiful sister city of Santa Fe's, I believe we have 12 of them, but we got chosen to go and teach and lecture and visit the amazing city of Ichyan, South Korea. 
It is an opportunity I will never, never forget. It wasn't anything I subscribed to do, it just fell in my lap. And if you work hard, smile a lot, and be extremely kind and helpful to other people in your chosen field, these wonderful opportunities absolutely come your way. Just about eight weeks ago, I got a phone call out of the blue. It was one of those phone calls, never in a million years, what I had ever anticipated. But what happened was, I got a call. They didn't ask me, they simply told me I was being inducted into the who's who in America. And being the slight skeptic that I am, I immediately said, oh, you mean who's who in American art world? which to me would have been one of the biggest honors ever. And they said, oh no, this is who's who in America. And I said, you mean with Ruth Bader Ginsburg? And they said, precisely. So this is something I am so honored to have received. And it makes me want to work harder, better, and even more creatively. But in working hard, I think it's also always good in the same breath to give back to your community, give back to your world, and always give back to young students. It's the most fun in the world. It can be challenging, but it is the most rewarding.